I don't normally create videos for games that are being crowdfunded, but I did create an overview video, non-paid mind you, for Reiner Canisius Whale Riders that Grail Games kickstarted in 2020 and delivered in early 2021. So perhaps I should amend my policy to say, I don't normally create overview videos for games that are being kickstarted other than designs by Reiner Canizia, which is why today, giving a short overview of the Criminal Capers trilogy that is coming from US publisher, Bitewing Games. There are three titles in it, which is why it's a trilogy. You might've guessed that already from me saying the word trilogy. Each of them is a relatively quick playing game with one being for three to eight players, the others for two to five. Let me jump into overviews of how to play. Here are the components of Soda Smugglers, mock-up components, mind you, created by the Game Crafter for use in an explanatory video like this one. Each player starts with 10 bottle caps, bottle caps being the currency of the game because Soda has been outlawed and we have decided it's far better to deal in bottle caps than actual money because our nostalgia is so strong for the days when Soda was running from fountains everywhere. We each start with 10 bottle caps so that we have something to lose as is often the case in Kanitia games, you are going to take turns being the guard, trying to keep people from smuggling soda into the country. And on the other turns, you are the one trying to smuggle soda in. You have a number of action tokens that you adjust based on the player count. So in my mock five player game, I'm going to have these four action tokens that I will explain in a moment. Each player gets a hand of five cards and they are going to look at those cards and put out two suitcases that they are trying to use to smuggle soda into the country. And then they will you choose a third card. They will be choosing these cards, mind you, not just taking them at random off the top like this. They will choose a third card to serve as a bribe for your humble border agent with the other cards being discarded back into the deck. So each player puts out two cards and a bribe, two cards and a bribe, two cards and a bribe. And once all the bribes are there, you're going to turn them all face up. Again, mock-up components. Not sure what the final will look like. These are the bribes that you are offering to the agent to try to get me to let you through. So if I decide, I can decide, I can take one bribe because I have one token available. In a game with more players, I might have more of those. But in this current game, I can accept at most one bribe. I do not have to accept any bribes, but if I do, I spend that token, I say, sure, I'll take your two bottles that you were trying to offer me and you give me two bottle caps. And then you get to cash in whatever you were trying to smuggle into the country. So you gave me two, you get four, you gain two on that deal, I gain two, seems fair to me. Me being a not so upright border guard. I can look at one suitcase because I have one investigation token. If I had multiple tokens, which again, with more players, you would, I cannot use them both to look at both suitcases from one player. I have to spread that around. I can't just pick on someone completely, but I can spend my token. We look at the suitcase. It is empty. Hmm. Suitcases range from zero to three bottles. And now comes the last part where I can arrest up to two people. Now, you arrest someone, and if they have collectively two or more bottles in the suitcases they're trying to smuggle, the bribe does not count. They had offered that to you. Essentially, that is gone, whether you take it or not. If they have two or more bottles, then they're caught. You can just swing for the fences. I can look at this. Well, this guy's clear. I don't know what's in here. Maybe I just say, fine, I'm gonna try to arrest you. And you flip these over. Ah, oh, three bottles, you louse, trying to get that in here. And then I confiscate these goods for myself and I collect those three. I do not take them from the player, but from the supply. I just take those bottles. Now I'm gonna cash them in myself on the black market. If I go and catch someone, oh, they've got two. There we go, there's my example I need. If someone has one or fewer, oh man, I accused him falsely of trying to smuggle stuff in when he was perfectly within the customs limit. I am so sorry. Let me offer you two caps from my own personal supply as an apology and please don't tell my supervisor. Oh, and this person did have one bottle there so they do get one from the bank. There you go. That's the example of a round. 
Each player is going to be the border guard twice in a three and four player game and once in five to eight players. And at the end of the game, whoever has the most caps wins. I've played Soda Smugglers twice on this monk up copy, once with five players, then again with four. With five players, it felt like the game was too short because as I mentioned, you go around the table being the border guard only once. I was guard in the very first hand of the game because I had explained everything. I thought I'd just jump in and be the guard and I was done with it. I didn't have a chance to see how other people bluff and try to get things through and then respond to that when I was the guard again. It's just my time was done, over. And I wanted more than that. Someone then had to leave the group and we played again immediately with four and you go twice around the table and that was far more enjoyable just because you could play off what other people were doing. This design is similar to other types of designs with it's just a straight bluffing game for the most part where you're playing off other people, trying to fool them into what you are doing and score. It's similar to Heart and the Grenza, which was then remade as Sheriff of Nottingham. Extremely straightforward because it's almost nothing but the bluffing. That's it. Put down the cards. People are going to look at you. They're going to judge how many bottle caps you have, what you might be trying to do. Maybe you get a little information. You got the bribe that you're putting out there, which is a little information as well. Possibly you're trying to trap someone. You're going to offer them a bribe and you think that they think you're going to have lots of bottles and then they're going to arrest you and haha, you actually trick them and they have to pay you instead. But you need more rounds to sort of get that level of familiarity with your other players to see how they're responding and how things change over time as someone starts collecting caps and someone steals it and this person regularly does this. Well, with five players, there was really no regular does this, regularly does this because you play five hands and you're done. So you are of course free to adjust however you wish and play multiple times around the table. It will no longer be a 20 minute design, but that's up to you. Otherwise, it's all straightforward, playing the players, the very straightforward bluffing system. Now, let's move on to number two, Pumafiosi. Here are the components of Pumafiosi, which again are mock-up components, which is a good thing given that the player colors include three shades of reddish brown that are somewhat hard to distinguish when you're putting tokens on the table. Each player has a wealth card and a penalty card, and you'll be putting tokens on it over the course of a round. At the end of a round, if I have two negative and five positive, well, then we balance the scales and I have three positive. The rules suggest playing three rounds total and whoever has the highest score at the end of three rounds wins. You have a scoring chart with numbers that go from 10 to negative three. Each player is going to be dealt 10 cards from a deck that has cards numbered one to 55. You're dealt 10 and you draw three of those to have in your hand. The others you do not look at. You are going to play one of the cards from your hand, draw a replacement card, and each player is going to play a card into the center. Whoever plays the second highest card in this group gets to place their card onto the chart. So you don't want to be the top boss because they get taken down. You want to be the second in command, the helper guy who's getting everything done. You are going to place this card at any level that you wish with the fear that you might not stay there. So each player is going to continue playing cards. You mark whatever you win. You go here, 43 wins. So now 43 maybe decides to go here. And you have another five cards that come out, 41 wins. So you can go here if you wish and top 43, that's okay. Or you can decide I'm gonna slot down here or you can be aggressive and you wanna push someone out. So if I go in the spot where someone already is and I am higher than they are, they get pushed down a rank. So I got here and they would get a negative token because they fell one space in the chart of bad guys that we are creating here. I forget what the actual name is. So again, we have five cards, 49 wins, 49 can go anywhere. 49 can sacrifice points to hit this one. It can go here as well, which is sacrifice even more points. Not a good deal necessarily. They might just want to go in the 10 spot and hope not to be bumped out. So you're paying attention to which cards have been played, who can overtake you. There's already been some 50s that have passed by. You got a 26 is the second highest card. And let's just say we go here because we're gonna be bold. You play through all 10 cards, ooh, 40. So 40 
could go here, sure. And now bumps down 26, which falls again. So purple is going to get two negative points for falling two spaces. And then 23 falls down and gets another negative as well. So you are going to be having this chart here. There's 10 rounds in which you're playing cards. There's only nine slots. So two of the cards are going to end up in the graveyard, possibly more depending on where people go. You don't have to start here with these high numbers. You could end up playing low. Maybe someone comes in with what they hope to be a high number, but it might get outranked and then boot, 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 and then fall down a ton and lose a lot of points. Depends on where you are in the round, what cards have already been played and what you think is left. Because with five players, you're going to use 50 of the 55 cards. With fewer players, well, you're not even seeing a lot of the cards, so you don't know what is in play. But at the end of the round, you're going to get paid out based on your current standings. Maybe this is me taking a bold move here for 10. If it ends up this way with a couple more cards on here, I get 12 points. I add 12, well, I lose two off here, but I get 10, and there we go. Play three rounds, no score wins. Puma Fiosi is a new version of 2004's Hennen Renin, aka Rooster Booster, a Kinesia game that few people have probably heard of at this point. That earlier design had a three-part game board and wooden roosters that would climb and fall on the ladder. And perhaps there's some German saying I don't know about, about ladder climbing roosters that would have all that make sense, but it, Today's game has mobster cats, so perhaps not. You're just going with something that seems cool at the time and allows for fun puns with the immer weiter auf der Leiter, right? You have clever things that help sell a game. So you have the component changes to the game and the setting changes, and you also have changes to the game design itself, where that earlier design had cards numbered 1 to 100, and this has cards only 1 to 55. So when you are playing cards, you are playing within a tighter range, which gives you a little better idea of where you're going to fall on the chart. And that's good or bad, depending on how much randomness you want. Now, the chart itself has changed. In the earlier chart, the high value was 8 and the low was negative 1. And now you have a range from 10 to negative 3. So you got a wider range of points in which things will fall over the course of the game. I will mention I've played Pumafiosi only once so far with three players, which is a shame because Knizia games usually get better the more that you play them you become familiar with the system and how the flow of the game works i love playing them as much as i can but i have to go with one play right now and then just talk about that you do play three rounds so you have some repetition in how things work and it definitely grows on you as you play more because we finish that first round we're sort of like uh, okay, I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but we had better ideas of what to do in the second and third rounds in general. Now, you're playing somewhat randomly because you've got a deck of 10 cards, but you have only three cards in your hand and you just have to go with that. You can't look at everything, which is probably a good thing because if you did have all your cards in your hand, the last player to play on a turn could probably always thread that needle and end up in the second spot and score. Here, you've got more randomness as to what's happening because you are limited to only those three cards. And if you win with, say, a 25 on the first hand, where is it gonna go? Well, the range is one to 55. Maybe you just plunk it right in the middle on that five spot. And you figure that's the appropriate spot to go with a 25 that's halfway between the ends. Sure, you can do that, or you can take chances and go up a little higher go down a little lower to be more secure and possibly bump other people down over time. You're taking chances on what's going to happen because again, limited information and in what's available. It's only a 20 minute game. It's gonna be some wild turns and how things come out. You can make smarter calculations and you can make worse calculations uh, as I did at the end of our third game where I put a relatively low number in the top spot gambling that it was going to stay there because I think we were only playing one or two more cards and I had low cards and I expected other people to also end up with low cards, but nope, that got bumped down. I lost five points because it fell five spaces and that was my margin of loss. 
I would have won if I had put that card in the spot where it should have gone in the first place, but I took a chance to go high because I don't count people's score to see uh, you know, what's a safe play. I just wing it. I go with my gut, which is okay. Over time, you get more experience and you see how things work. So that's the gist of Pumafiosi. Again, playing somewhat randomly, just go with your gut and see how things go. And if you have fun pushing other people down, well, you can place your cards in order to do that. Maybe you have this chain reaction where lots of people fall and you can push everyone into that graveyard worth negative three points. That can be fun in its own right too. And see who ends up with the best score at the end of that. Now, Hot Lead is another quick playing card game for two to five players. I forgot to mention as well, Pumafiosi has a two player variant which uses the dummy player, so I'll never use it. I'll just play something else instead. But it is there, which is different from Henan Renan. Hot Lead has an actual two player version. We'll talk about how to play the game. Here are the components of Hot Lead. Mock-up components, mind you. Two decks of cards and five promotion tiles that I'll put off to the side because they are an optional item during play. You have the Investigator deck, which consists of cards numbered 1 to 55, which will sound familiar after hearing the description of Pumafiosi, except that each player is dealt a hand of 11 cards and they put all of those cards in their hand. During play, you're going to turn over as many cards as the number of players and these criminal cards come in five colors with values ranging from zero to five. Each player is going to choose a card from their hand, put them in front of themselves, you reveal them all at the same time, and then whoever has played the highest number is going to get the card that is closest to the deck. I mean, you can arrange them how you wish. This is how the rules describe it. So everyone is going to get a card, but what number you get depends on what everyone else plays. So you're going to put your one card in front of you, clear that away, turn over five new cards. Everyone puts down a card again, you'll get something else and you will go through 10 rounds of this. You will not play the final card in your hand. So you will collect at most 10 cards. Now, I say at most because you are going to sort the cards by color as you collect them. And if you get a fourth card of a color, you throw away all of those cards. Everything. That's terrible. But of course, you want to get three cards of a color because that will give you a bonus of 10 points. It's a classic Kinesia thing. It has to push you right to the edge and then you risk going over the edge if you end up getting a card that you don't want. You don't know if any more green cards are going to come up in the deck. You don't know what number cards everyone else has in their hand, but maybe you wanna get that third one to lock in those 10 points and just hope everything works out for you. So you're going to sort the cards in front of you. Let me sort them more favorably for you. And each card that you collect is worth as many points as the number on that card. So this is a four, mind you, not a nine. Everyone confused, got confused by that. So hopefully that will change before print. This is 12 points at the moment. 16, 16, there you go, 20 points. One more card, 23 points. I got my 10 cards here. Again, if you get a set of three, that's worth 10. So 23, 33, 43. If you have all five colors, light and dark gray are different, that's another 10. So 53 points total for this collection. It could be higher if I had gotten cards other than zeros. It could be far lower if I had ended up with cards of the wrong color and I just lose all this and I end up with only two cards. So you got lots of chancy play for how things are going to come out and whoever ends up with the most points wins. The promotional tiles add an extra element to the game with one tile of each color, and the first player to collect two cards of that color claims this tile, which is worth a bonus of five points. And if there's a tie for people getting their second green card in the same turn, whoever has played the higher investigator card in that turn claims this tile, which gives you a different incentive for why you might want to play something at a particular time. Now, gameplay in Hot Lead is somewhat reminiscent of Wolfgang Kramer's Six Nymphed, mostly because you have a hand of numbered cards, you are all playing simultaneously, and you are trying to end up in the right spot in the row. 
You are not claiming penalty points, but of course collecting a criminal card, but some cards are better than others. Often it doesn't matter. At the beginning of the game, if there's two fives available, you don't care which five you get because you have no investment in one color or another. You just want a five. Everyone else does as well. So what are you going to play compared to everyone else? You're just taking chances and you'll see what happens. And as people play more cards, well, you see what goes out of play. You can especially, if it depends on how well you can track things. You track the high 50s, you track the really low numbers. You can get some idea of safer plays or plays that give you better odds of getting something. And then there's that big middle ground where it's a little harder to keep track of everything. And maybe things out work out for you and maybe they don't. I played Hot Lead only one time so far with four players. Again, I prefer to play Kinesia games far more, but this is the experience I have at this moment. One player really despised the game, feeling it was completely random, which is what some people say about Six Nymph as well. I should just shuffle my cards and play them at random and things will work out just as well for me if I put thought into it. I find that's usually not true, that you can play better than random chance in Six Nymph, and I feel somewhat confident that that's the case here as well, but again, limited experience. That's what I'm running on. Other people had a more positive opinion. My opinion, of course, was, huh, I should play this again before I really develop an opinion. As I pretty much do every time now with any Kinesia game, just because experience shows me that first impression is often just this, this founding for, you know, foundation for what my opinion will actually be. It's that large block of granite that has arrived. And I just look at it initially and I'm like, huh, I don't really know what that's going to be. And then you start chipping away as you play at something more and more and you see how things develop over time and how things are supposed to work and you get a better idea of how it works. Now, don't get me wrong, this is again a quick playing game, you know, 20 minute game for two to five players that is going to be somewhat random because you're just going with what cards you have in your hand. And if you have fewer than five players, well then some cards are not in play and you can take chances like I did. I played a 54 and the very first thing where five was the first card to be claimed, hoping that no one else had the 55. Worked out for me, may not work out another time. Who knows? You're going to have random chances on how things play out. Whether you get stuck with the fourth card of a color and have to ditch that color, it's all just quick playing, play it for laughs. There you go. You run everything out. So that's a quick overview of these three titles from a new US publisher, Bitewing Games, that will not have this artwork on the back when they're actually published, but gives you an overview of how things work if you are curious about this Kinesia Trio.